cloud. Okay. All right. Hello, and welcome to our nutrition class, The Art of Vegetables with registered dietitian Judy Palkin. Uh, this program is supported by federal funds from the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, in conjunction with the University of Massachusetts in Worcester. Um, I'm going to post a link um, on more uh, nutrition information in the chat, so go ahead and click that. I'm also going to put our survey in the chat, so please click that as well. We love to hear your feedback, and Judy, it is all yours. Thank you so much, Jen. And I, again, I really appreciate that the Worcester Public Library provides this and allows me to present. And um, I'm just grateful and I'm really happy that you're all here. So I am gonna go ahead and share my screen because I, again, I have slides and I wanna show them to you. Can you see that okay? Yep. Is there yes, yep. yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much. I know, I know people are muted, sorry about that. So, um, I'm, again, I'm a Judy, a registered dietitian speaking to you from my home in Northboro. And this class is called The Art of Vegetables. And um, th this topic is so important and I love to talk about it because really it's just simple. One of the best things we can do for our health is to eat a lot of vegetables. So I hope to address vegetables from a variety of different viewpoints, some practical advice, how delicious they are, easy to cook, and how beautiful they are. So we'll touch on all of that. And as before, if you've attended these classes, you'll get, if you're registered, you'll get a, um, uh, an email with an image of the slides. So what I wanna talk about is the nutritional value of veggies, why they're so good for us, and some in particular that are exceptionally good for us that I want you to know about. Some veggie advice, so practical information about how you can get more vegetables into your diet if you need to do that. And with that, some advice on cooking vegetables. And I want you to be thinking of a plan, even if it's just one or two simple things you can do to improve your vegetable intake. There's usually room for improvement. And throughout the whole thing, I'm going to be showing you some vegetable art, some fine art paintings of vegetables, because those, you know, showing paintings of the topic we're discussing, I think allows us to see it sometimes in a different light. And just like with fruit, there's some really gorgeous paintings of vegetables out there. So I wanna share some of those with you. I like to think of this as nutrition with a side of appreciation for art. So I'm gonna start right off with two paintings that I think tell a really heartwarming story. Um, they're both by Manet, um, French painter, not to be confused with Monet, so Edouard Manet. Um, in 1880, he was commissioned by Charles Effrussi, who was an art historian, an art patron, to paint a bundle of asparagus. And this was the painting, and I just think it's gorgeous. Um, and he, the deal they had arranged was that he would be paid 800 francs. And when the time came, Effrussi gave Manet a thousand francs. So what did Manet do? He painted this small additional painting. It, it took me a minute to see what it is. It's a, it's a stalk of asparagus. It's not a wave coming up on a beach, which is what I thought at first. It's one single stalk of asparagus sprig. And he sent it over with a note to Effrussi saying there was one sprig missing from your bundle. Um, I love the story because I think it says a lot about the character of both men, just really good. And I, I wish both paintings were together. Let me back up. The first one is in Germany, and the second one is actually at Musée d'Orsay in Paris. It really seems like these two paintings need to live together, but oh well, the story is just great, I think. And asparagus is a really nice vegetable. So anyway, what is a vegetable? The question was really easy with fruit. There's a very specific definition of what a fruit is. It's the seed bearing structure of a flowering plant. So like an apple, for example. But with a vegetable, it's everything else. <laughs> it's everything else about plants. So that encompasses a lot of different parts. It could be a root, like a carrot. It could be a tuber like a potato, a tuber, by the way, is a storage. Um, it's you, usually develops kind of at the base of the stem and it's a storage kind of organ for the plant to store nutrients for future use. 
So in the case of a potato, it's storing a lot of starch. Um, it could be leaves like lettuce, a flower like broccoli, um, a stem like in a scallion, seeds like in legumes, and it could even, the definition of a vegetable could even include nuts and cereal grains, although we don't usually think of it that way. So lots and lots of different parts of the plants are vegetables. Let's talk for just a minute here about good nutrition and the proportions that we should try to somehow approximate when we eat. Um, you might have seen the my plate diagram on a lot of food packages, and this is my own kind of version of that. Um, at any given meal, roughly half of what we eat should be fruits and vegetables, with a real emphasis on vegetables. And only a quarter should be grains or starchy vegetables, and the other quarter should be the high protein food. So what that means is we should be eating a lot of vegetables. Um, and now I want to tell you America's favorite vegetables, uh, according to um, you know, what gets bought and what gets used and surveys. And the three favorites are potatoes, tomatoes, and onions. And other studies show that only one in 10 adults get enough fruits and vegetables. And we fall especially short in the vegetables. And too, too often, they look like this. People count this. They count pizza, because of the tomato sauce, the little bit of tomato sauce that you get on a slice of pizza. And they count things like French fries because it is after all a potato. But we have to look at what, what's really going on here. What's, especially with the pizza, it's got all that almost always white flour and sometimes not very healthy toppings. And the French fries of course are deep fried. So these are not healthy choices that I would consider to be a vegetable, even though botanically there's vegetables going on there. So I think, um, I know we can do a lot better. And as, as uh, our, our old friend Popeye, who you might remember, <laughs> used to say, you know, we should eat our spinach and lots of other really, really healthful vegetables. So, they really are super nutritious vegetables as a group. Um, they tend to be high in a lot of vitamins, in particular vitamin A. Of course, it's not really vitamin A, it's carotenoids that get converted in the body to vitamin A, but we say they're high in vitamin A value. Vitamin C, E, and K, and also folate, a very important B vitamin. They're high in a lot of minerals, including but not limited to potassium, calcium, iron, and zinc. They're high in fiber, and they're high in great healthful phytochemicals. So by eating vegetables, we feel our best. We're able to do more of what we want to do. So here's a, a painting by Matisse, just um, in his later years, depicting some vegetables. Um, so what are these phytochemicals that you hear about? It's just a term that means plant chemicals, and there's a lot of them. There's hundreds of them. We don't know them all, but some of them function as antioxidants and help to protect the body from harmful free radicals. Some of them um, act as anti-inflammatory compounds, and as you may know, it's inflammation in the body that's a contributing factor for a lot of diseases. Um, they seem to decrease disease risk, the phytochemicals. They protect the plants and they also seem to protect us. It's a real win-win. And they seem to have a role in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease and certain cancers. And they're good for cognitive health and they're good for immune function. And the more colorful the vegetables you choose, um, the more great phytochemicals you will get. Very often the pigments themselves are these antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds. So if you choose dark produce like this eggplant here, you will get phytochemicals called anthocyanins and they're good for heart health and, um, uh, excuse me, I'm just gonna try to make this smaller on my screen. There. They're good for memory, they're good for cognitive health, um, 
So you can get these wonderful anthocyanins by eating any dark produce, including eggplants, purple and red onions, purple and red cabbage, red and other, other deeply colored peppers, and spinach. And you could probably think of a lot others. Um, another great category to choose from often, even every day, is to get some nice red and yellow and orange vegetables. If they're these colors, they will have carotenoids. Carotenoids are a compound, um, you've probably heard of beta carotene and lycopene, or maybe, maybe you haven't, but they're in there and they seem to decrease inflammation and they're associated with heart health and a reduced risk of some cancers. Um, beta carotene in particular, there's some exciting research that's showing that beta carotene can help to protect our skin from the damage of UV rays. So just like we might try to stay out of the midday sun and wear sun protective clothing and sunscreen, another thing we can do is to eat these bright yellow and orange and red vegetables to protect our skin. I just think that's so exciting. So some good examples would be carrots, um, pumpkin, as well as other winter squash, any deeply colored peppers like red, orange, and yellow, sweet potatoes, beets, and dark leafy greens. And even though dark leafy greens are not red, yellow, or orange, those pigments, those carotenoids are in there. They're just masked by the chlorophyll in the dark leafy greens. Okay, here's a Van Gogh um, of a peasant woman stoop, stooping to dig up carrots from 1885. Um, he did several of these. I'm going to show you a couple more a little later, but I just look at that and think, wow, what backbreaking work, these poor people. Okay, here's a beautiful John Singer Sargent entitled Gourds. Now, gourds are in the same family with the squash that we tend to eat. Like, um, well, I, I put this here to remind me to emphasize about, for example, butternut squash. So any of the winter squash that are bright orange um, would be a really good choice for these carotenoids. Gourds, we usually tend not to eat. They're tougher, but they're, again, in the same family. So spectacular choice is dark leafy green vegetables. It doesn't get much better than that. They are the superstars. Not only do they have a ton of vitamins and minerals, but they've got two carotenoids in particular, lutein and zeaxanthine, which are really good for the eyes. And of course, by the way, you don't need to know the names of these phytochemicals. All that's important to know is that they're in there and they're really good for us. So as we age, um, a lot of us are at increasing risk for macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma. It seems that these carotenoids go to the eye and they help to protect it from these diseases. So fantastic reason to eat them. And they're good for heart health and brain health. So when you're at the supermarket or the farm stand, be sure to pick up something like spinach, kale, Swiss chard, collard greens, beet greens, Brussels sprouts. And of course there's others. You might like some of the lesser known uh, ones like the dandelion greens and the mustard greens. If it's dark green, it's good. They are really easy to cook. Um, it's extremely easy. You just get them home, wash them, cut them up, and saute them in something like olive oil. And this was some beet greens with some leeks. And I want to show you what happened. You probably know this if you've sauteed greens. Um, maybe I sauteed this for a minute or two too long. I don't know. But the, the point is the greens cook way down. What's left showing here is the leeks. But this was this many greens. So this is bad news if you love those sauteed greens and you want a big portion. They always seem to cook way down. It's good news if you're cooking for somebody picky who doesn't want a lot of greens. You can get a lot in in a small serving because they really do cook down and they're so delicious. Another fantastic 
healthful category of vegetables is the cruciferous vegetables, also called the brassica family. Um, so this includes broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, and a bunch of others. Um, and there's even more than I've got on this slide. There's many more. It's a big family. Um, but they've got compounds that seem to inhibit the development of certain cancers, and they seem to reduce cardiovascular risk. So it's a really good idea to include plenty of cruciferous vegetables in your diet. Here's another Van Gogh of uh, red cabbages and onions. I uh, wanted to remember to tell you that cabbage, I think, is often overlooked. Cabbage is a super cruciferous vegetable. It's got all those healthful compounds. There's different varieties of cabbage. I think it's one of the healthiest things we can eat. And it doesn't get all the attention that broccoli and cauliflower get. So I really wanted to mention it. Arugula, another member of the cruciferous vegetables. Um, I've been finding it just uh, wonderful bunches of arugula at farm stands this summer. Um, it's really nice to make a salad out of. It's got a nice kind of peppery flavor. And Judy, uh, Judy we have a question. Sure. Uh, yeah. From Elaine, even though cauliflower is not green, but white, is it still as healthy for you? Yes. Yeah. Great question, Elaine. And I am going to talk more about that in a minute. Even light colored produce is really good for us. And cauliflower does have those compounds because it's cruciferous and it's got vitamin C and, you know, on and on. So yes, it's very good. I mean, it, it might not be quite as good as broccoli, but you pick whichever you like, you, you know, maybe you alternate them. But yes, it is very good. Beets are spectacular. First of all, being red, they've got those great compounds that I mentioned with those, you know, colored red and yellow and, or and orange produce. But beets are unique in that they're the highest that I know of anyway in nitrates. And, and it's actually a good thing. In the body, that goes through a pathway and gets converted to nitric oxide. And that can act to lower blood pressure. For anybody that might be dealing with high blood pressure, it's a good thing. And it can also reduce the amount of oxygen needed during exercise. And studies have shown enhanced athletic performance, like people being more efficient riding a bike, for example. Um, so if you do anything athletic, or even just you like to get out there and take a walk, it's a great idea to have some beets if you like them. Um, athletes are turning to them. They're drinking beet juice, which you can buy in supermarkets. Um, and if you don't like beets or you don't think you're gonna eat them very often, leafy green vegetables also have quite a significant amount of these wonderful nitrates. Here's Van Gogh again. I seem to have a lot of Van Gogh today, um, but he was spectacular. So a peasant lifting a beet and a woman, a peasant woman planting beets, both from 1885, really busy time for him. Again, you know, just, how hard this work looks. And I wonder, you know, were these two real people? They probably were, were they married? It's, you know, there's no way to know, but you just look at them and go, wow, thank you for all you too. And here's a Gagan, um, still life with onions, beetroot, and there's a Japanese print also off to the right. So he spent his later years in the South Pacific and that comes out in his paintings in bright colors. And you can see that in the beets, really pretty. Okay, now I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about artichoke. Um, I can only see a few of you, but raise your hand if you like artichokes. Okay, so at least a couple. I'm gonna be honest here. It's my favorite vegetable in the whole world by a long shot. I grew up loving them and that's never left me. So they're not an easy vegetable. You can't eat them raw, that I know of anyway. Um, they've got, they've got that, those um, thorns on them, so you have to handle them just right. They're a bit of work to eat, but they are so delicious. So if anybody listening to this or watching this has not tried them, I really urge you to, to try them. I'm going to tell you just a little about them. They're a species of thistle. They're native to the Mediterranean region, but now they're mostly grown in Cal a lot in California, as well as uh, Mediterranean, France, Italy, and Spain. 
we harvest them to eat them before they bloom, before they blossom. What we're eating is the immature bud. And I just want to show you this painting I found um, from 1917. This is what they look like if they flower. So we never see that, or at least I never have. Um, the most common variety is the globe artichoke, also called the French or the green artichoke. It's no relationship whatsoever to the Jerusalem artichoke. That's a totally different kind of plant. Um, they can be cooked in a variety of ways, boiling them, steaming them, baking, roasting, grilling. Most often I do some kind of a hybrid of boiling and steaming. I'll partially submerge them in a lot of water, a lot because it takes a good hour to cook them <laughs> um, unless they're small but it can take an hour to get them to be tender enough. So you have to know that you want artichokes. What's edible is the base of the leaves, which you kind of scrape along your upper teeth um, and you get this delicious vegetable matter. Also the heart, which you can buy in cans or jars and the stems. Um, what's usually not eaten, <clears throat> excuse me, is called the choke. And that's this fibrous stuff in the middle of it except if you buy baby artichokes, which sometimes you can find in supermarkets like in a six pack, and they're so tender that you can usually eat the whole thing, including the choke. Judy, we have another question about sauteing greens down. Sure. Uh, do, you, do you lose nutritional value when you do that? Um, so when you cook vegetables, you lose a little bit of nutritional value with the heat, especially if it's prolonged. And in particular, it's vitamin C that I'm most aware of that is not very heat stable. So sauteing is generally quick, and I don't think you would lose very much. But like, let's say you boiled some greens for several minutes, you might lose a significant amount of vitamin C. Another question about artichokes. Can you buy them frozen? You can buy the hearts frozen. I've never seen the whole artichoke or even like halved artichokes frozen. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Um, Trader Joe's, one of my favorite stores, sells bags sometimes of frozen artichoke hearts. And I love to have those on hand. I've got at least one bag in my freezer now. And what I mainly have used it for is like to just dump into a pasta sauce. It tastes great. You really do taste them in the pasta sauce but you could do whatever you wanted with them. A little more about artichokes. You're not off the hook yet with artichokes. These are, you don't find these just everywhere, sold with the long stem. Usually it's cut off like within an inch or two of the base of the, the globe. And the only place I've seen these is Wegmans in Northborough. They may be available elsewhere, but every now and then Wegmans has them. Not usually, but when I see them, I definitely buy them. And then what I do, because they're so long, they won't fit in my, my normal cooking pot, is I cut off the stem, but I still cook it, and I still try to eat it. It's kind of tough, but that doesn't stop me, because I love artichokes so much. So if you see those, give them a try. So I thought for the longest time that artichokes are just delicious, but they couldn't possibly be very nutritious. They're not that dark or anything, but it turns out I was wrong and this is nice. Um, they really are super nutritious. They're very high in fiber, high in vitamin K, folate, that B vitamin, magnesium, potassium, and they're one of the highest antioxidant vegetables. Who knew? Not me, but now, now we know. So they've got antioxidants that might help promote liver health, and they've got a bunch of others that seem to help uh, with uh, reducing risk of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Okay, so moving on. Oh, actually one more. Here's a painting with an artichoke. So this artichoke is sliced like lengthwise. So you're seeing the whole inside of it. So this is amazing. This painting is from 1625. Clara Peters, who was from Antwerp, um, and she's got some spectacular paintings of food. I'll be sure to show more in future classes, but I just think the detail here with the cherries and the artichoke and the cheese and everything is just gorgeous. No, no caterer setting up an arrangement today could do better. 
And um, as, as back to Elaine's question from before, even light colored vegetables are good for us. You'll hear, oh, celery is not good for you. Iceberg lettuce is not good for you. The truth is that they all have benefits, some of them a lot. Um, in particular, um, garlic, onions, celery, green cabbage. Um, these are all really good for us and we should use them. If you like them, use them. A uh, quick question from Philomena. Uh, mm -hmm. What kinds of veggies did you include in your stir fry from earlier when you were sauteing vegetables? Oh, that just had beet greens and leeks. Okay. And I, yeah, I want to emphasize that when I saute le um, greens, which I tend to do a lot, I love to cut up leeks and put them in there. And I do use the whole leek, even the very dark part. It's really good. Um, but you could just as easily use onion or scallions, but I just think leeks add something really nice. Um, and that's another thing that Trader Joe's has on occasion. I haven't seen it for a while, but sometimes they have it as bags of frozen chopped leeks. Anyway, um, more about cooking in a little bit. Garlic has some compounds that seem to reduce cardiac risk and garlic also has antibacterial compounds. Same thing with onion. Onion has a great phytochemical called rutin that acts as an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, seems to reduce risk of heart disease. And onion also has antibacterial activity. So this brings me to something. Let me close this again. Okay. So this is from Michael Pollan's book, Cooked. Michael Pollan is a food journalist who some of you may be familiar with. He wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma, and he wrote this great book called Cooked, where he's talking about how we as a species have been transformed by food, by cooking, by how we cook. So he poses the question, why is it that onions are so widespread in pot dishes? And his section on pot dishes talks about how mankind was changed once we started cooking in pots because now that we could eat cooked food, we didn't have to spend like 12 hours every day chewing to get our nutrients. It just made them so much more easy and available to get. So why are onions so widespread? He said, after salt, I can't think of another cooking ingredient quite as universal as the onion. He said, they grow almost anywhere in the world that people can grow anything. I had not known that. Um, and he points out that they're cheap, they're readily available, they add umami. Umami is a taste that's savory. So it's found in meat and mushrooms and um, certain other foods like onions. And then he, he speculates, and he's not the first person to think of this, other people have said this, that the flavors in plants like garlic and onion may taste good to us because it might be a learned preference for the taste of molecules that helped to keep us alive because of the antimicrobial properties back before refrigeration. So we think we really like them, but it's just something that came in handy for us. So we learned to like them. Who knows, but I think it's a fascinating idea. And I recommend this book. There's some nice paintings of onions. This is Renoir's Onions at the Clark Art Institute. Uh, Matisse, the red onions from 1906, really brightly colored onions. And gorgeous Van Gogh, still life with ginger jar and onions. I read one artist's review of this painting and she was saying it's what, just one of his most beautiful paintings. It's not typical Van Gogh, what we think of with the broad brush strokes. It was before that period, but um, just the beautiful objects and the loving way he presented the jar and the onions is really nice. And then I, some people, people often wonder about starchy vegetables and people do more than wonder about them. People exclude them. People go on a lot of diets and they, a lot of these diets say no starchy vegetables, too much starch, too much carbohydrate, no good. And they're talking about vegetables like potato, sweet potato, 
corn, peas, lentils, as well as beans, like kidney beans, winter squash. So what's the story here? The story is they're super nutritious. They tend to have a lot of nutrients of all kinds, vitamins, phytochemicals, fiber. We love them. We should be allowed to eat them. There's no good reason to exclude them. We just need to sometimes be moderate with them in the way that we don't have to be as moderate with maybe um, a bowl of broccoli. So, you know, it might be the kind of conversation you're having with yourself. Well, I'm going to have a second or third year of corn. Maybe I won't have that bread, <laughs> something like that. But definitely, if you like them, include them because they are very good for you. And here is um, another Van Gogh, um, this time potatoes, basket of potatoes. What I love here is, even though I think you could call this monochromatic, it's, you know, there's not a lot of color going on, but it's yet, it's so gorgeous, I think. Just that basket and those potatoes. And I'm gonna stop here. First, I wanna, I wanna ask if anybody has any questions before I move on, but also I want you to think, and maybe if anyone wants to answer this, I'd love to hear it. We'd probably all love to hear it. What's your favorite vegetable? And what, if any, vegetables do you not like? And does any of this go back to your childhood? I do have a question from Ingrid about cooking. Um, mm -hmm. Can you add butter to olive oil while sauteing? Yes, you certainly can. Good question. I'm trying to think of my favorite vegetable and I don't know, I think it'd be like a, a garden ripe tomato with some salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Sounds really good. Does anybody else want to share? I hear typing, so maybe somebody's sharing via chat, which is fine. Um, oh, we have an, I don't like eggplant from Monica. It's the texture that gets me. You know, it's interesting. I know other people that don't like eggplant. It must be one, maybe it is a textural yeah, thing. I, I have uh, some people that I know that don't like it as well. Yeah. I think sometimes too, they might be put off by the word egg. I, I, I had that experience where somebody thought there was a relationship. I, I don't don't ask, but yeah. Uh, oh, we got some others really here. Um, baked okay. potato, plain, is a favorite for Philomena. Mm -hmm. uh, Patty loves broccoli. Mm -hmm. uh, dislikes fennel. Uh, Elaine um, also doesn't like eggplant. Okay. And too many favorites to mention. Uh, but Philomena uh, says roasted eggplant is great. I agree. has <laughs> trouble cooking it herself. Okay. Hmm. We'll get, maybe we'll talk about that with um, roasted veggies in a few minutes. Okay, any others or should I move on? I think we're good in the chat. Okay. Oh, no, uh, okra. We don't like okra, Melody. Okay. Okay. And everyone's entitled to not like and to love certain vegetables. So now I want to switch gears from the nutritional value and try to give you some practical advice if you think you need more vegetables in your diet. There are so many easy ways to get more vegetables in your diet. So most of us eat three meals a day. I realize not everybody, but a lot of people eat three meals a day and we're missing an opportunity if we're not thinking of breakfast as an opportunity to get vegetables in. It doesn't tend to be an American habit, but that's just cultural. In certain cultures, like I think in Israel, it's very common to have a salad with chopped cucumbers and tomatoes in the morning. And there's nothing to stop us from doing that. It could be a small salad. It could be adding veggies like this to scrambled eggs or an omelet. Things like uh, mushrooms and peppers and tomatoes go really well in there, onions. Um, it could be just deciding to eat some leftover roasted vegetables with breakfast. So there's, no, there's nothing wrong with it at all. And it's just one more opportunity to get in those vegetables. Sorry about that. A great way to do it, and it doesn't have to be in the morning, but for some people it just works out really well in the morning, is to make a veggie smoothie. So if you, if you pull out your blender and, um, you know, it's a good idea to have a dark green in there. So maybe some kale or spinach or parsley. And it's also a good idea to have in there some fruit. 
to add a little sweetness, you know, to make the smoothie more appealing. So this is uh, a smoothie that contained, um, I don't have the amounts here, but it had water, beet greens, because that's what I had and it was great, uh, like half a carrot, a red pepper, cucumber, almonds, ginger, cherries, and some ice cubes. Um, so anyway, I, I do realize that one pe thing people struggle with is the color. So these are often called green smoothies and they can range from green to brownish to brownish green. And I know that, you know, people are not used to seeing that in a smoothie and they, they think, ugh, you know, I can't eat that. But you just have to get beyond that if you want to try this. It's just a function of those really healthy ingredients in there. And you, if you want to, you can get beyond it. And it's a spectacular way to get a lot of really healthful foods in fast. And if anybody has any digestive disorder, um, it's a way to get them in in a blended form that's very easily digested and absorbed. So it's got that going for it too. Uh, and Jean if, would, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no, Jean, uh, Jean would like to know if you cook the veggies before adding them to the smoothie. No, I never have. Nope. Um, okay, so for anybody that thinks this looks gross, I'm going to show you gross on the next slide. Get ready for this. Here's your other smoothie option. Of course, there's other smoothie options in the middle, but this is this was at a rest stop in Maine, you know. But this is what people, what a lot of people think of as a smoothie or a slushy. It's pure <laughs> sugar. So, you know, which would you rather have? Which would you, your body rather have? That or that? We probably all know the answer, huh? Another bit of advice is to keep frozen veggies on hand. Um, they are nutritious. They're frozen at their peak of nutrition, as the companies like to say, and it's true. So they can last months or even longer in your freezer. I would just encourage you to buy them without added salt or sauces. Most of them are plain, but it's always good to take a look at the label. And also in these uncertain times we're in, unfortunately, um, I think it's a really smart idea to have something like this in the freezer just in case you run out of fresh vegetables um, and you can't, if you don't have access right away to them, then you've always got some frozen ones. Uh, Judy, we have a question about um, smoothies and juiced veggies. So what's the difference between a smoothie and a juiced veggie or juiced veggies? Well, when you juice anything, whether it's fruit or vegetables, the fiber, the, the pulp gets left behind. So you're getting the vitamins and minerals, but you're not getting the fiber and fiber is really important. So I think it's better to make a smoothie with the whole food than just have the juice. I know some people do juice and then they take that pulp from the juicer and they bake it into muffins or something. But I question whether people are gonna be able to use it all. Whereas in a smoothie, you're just getting everything and you can blend it up so that it's pretty thin. And it, you know, it doesn't have to be too thick. You can always add more water or some kind of liquid. Um, but smoothies, the way to go. Um, it's a really good idea, at least a lot of the time, to consume your veggies with a good fat. For example, olive oil or soybean oil um, or walnut oil or something. We need fat to absorb the fat soluble vitamins that the veggies are full of and also some of the phytochemicals need fat to be absorbed. And it makes the veggies really palatable if they're cooked with some fat. It's a good idea also when you get your veggies home from the store to prep them. Um, it might mean washing them, it might mean cutting them up, them up. And I know that it seems like so much work when you're, you know, you're carrying groceries and you have to unpack groceries and all that. It's just one more thing. But if you get it done, what happens is you're more inclined to use them on a regular basis. If, you know, I had cut up the cauliflower here and washed the greens and washed everything and it, it's all set to go. It's all set to use once you do the work up front. It's also a good idea if you're trying to snack on, on more healthful veggies to keep them front and center in your fridge. So it might mean that you grab them rather than grabbing something less healthful if they're all set to go. Sometimes we just eat what we see.
salads are great at any meal. I urge you to have salads often. This, a friend of mine told me about this, um, arranging the salad with the ingredients in concentric circles. I'm sure other people could do a better job, but I thought it was kind of pretty. And um, it's really nice, like if you're bringing a salad to someone's house, which someday we'll be able to do again. <laughs> um, but it was extremely easy and kind of fun to do. Uh, we have a question from Philomena about, um, she noticed how you cut up the cauliflower for prepping. How do you store it in the fridge? In a bowl, a plastic bag? Either. Um, more and more these days, since you asked, <laughs> I'm going to like something that can be washed and reused. So I like a bowl with a plastic lid that I already have and put that over it rather than taking a new bag and reusing it, using that and then tossing it. So I'm trying just, you know, for environmental reasons to do that. But, you know, any way you want to store it so that you just kind of keep it covered is good. And I would not have cut up that cauliflower if I wasn't, if I didn't know that I was going to use it soon. Um, but I, but I knew in that situation that I was going to be using it soon. Same with the sweet potato. I wouldn't have washed that if I didn't know I was going to cook it that day or the next day. So sometimes your prep depends on what your plans are for those veggies. Um, don't let running out of lettuce or kale or whatever stop you from having a salad because that happens that we, you know, it, go, it might go bad in the fridge because we forget we have it or we forget to use it or we just run out or we're not in the habit of buying it. You can still make a salad. Um, here I've got watermelon, two kinds of tomatoes, pepperoncinis, olives, broccoli. I would still call this a salad. Um, in fact, I've got this very um, liberal definition of a salad. I like to say any three items. So these are fun. These are the purple carrots, fun to try. Um, cherry tomatoes and broccoli. I know it's a stretch calling this a salad, but think of the nutritional value of, let's say, your lunch with this versus without it. So whatever you call it, it's a good idea just to get your veggies. Here's a fun thing to do. Again, if you're, you know, when you can have company, is create a salad bar. So you simply put just the plain lettuce in a big bowl and put all the other ingredients out in little bowls and let people create their own. It's a lot of fun. I did this once when I was having company. You know, you're probably not going to do this just for yourself, but anyway, um, it's, it's kind of a fun and it lets people be creative and take what they want. Another option is to mix your salad fixings. So here's a bowl with artichoke hearts and pumpkin seeds and carrots and tomatoes and olives and a few other ingredients all mixed together. And then just over the course of a few days, every time you want a salad, you just scoop some of that onto the lettuce. Just another kind of creative way of doing it. And finally, kale salad. Kale salad is extremely easy and so good for you. Um, just with a little bit of uh, shaved Parmesan and those are whole wheat croutons and cherry tomatoes, um, really good. And I've actually included the recipe so that um, if you're interested, you'll be able to hopefully read it on the handout of the slides. Another bit of advice, um, that's like an easy cheat is to throw spinach into everything. So the way this can work, you can certainly use fresh spinach, but you can also keep a bag of frozen spinach going in your freezer and just every time you're having a soup or a salad or, or you're roasting chicken or having pasta sauce or anything, just throw some spinach in. No one will notice. It, again, it cooks down, it blends right in, but you're getting all that nutrition from the spinach. And here's another Van Gogh. I'm not sure if that's spinach. I, I tend to think not, but it's some leafy green vegetable along with the ingredients for a meal. There's, there's meat, there's bread, there's, I'm not sure, onions, apples, um, but some nice ingredients. And I love that he included a leafy green for our benefit. If you're simmering pasta sauce, and it doesn't matter whether you have 
prepared a pasta sauce from scratch or you've just opened one of those jars or you've done some combination of, of those two, add veggies. You can add peppers, mushrooms, eggplant, onions, grated carrots, squash, or any veggies you like. Um, and then when the pasta sauce is done, you can decide whether or not to blend it. You can just stick an immersion blender in it um, and blend it up if you want to hide the veggies from a picky eater or you just prefer a smooth pasta sauce or you can leave the chunks of veggies in there, you know, and then that's very nice too. But it's a great way to make the pasta sauce just incorporate so many veggies. You can serve your favorites on a platter of greens. Whatever you're serving, serve it on greens and then just be sure to eat those greens. And that includes appetizers. Now we all know that appetizers are not always the healthiest foods on the planet. Everyone knows that, you know, but you can make it healthier by serving it on greens or, or adding something like parsley sprigs, cucumbers, radishes, carrots, and celery. Just any opportunity to get some veggies in there. And if you are at a function in the future, you know how often these trays with wraps and sandwiches and bagels and things are served on a garnish of greens like kale or romaine, um, or there's a lot of parsley and very few people eat it. It's just viewed as a garnish. It's like a napkin to be thrown away when they take the tray away. But you can be the person that eats the garnish and you will eat the healthiest lunch in the room. And you'll get admiring looks. People, you'll see people thinking, I never thought of that. You can actually eat that stuff. And um, if you like to bake, include veggies in dessert, or if you're buying a dessert. And some classic examples would be pumpkin pie, carrot cake, and zucchini bread. And you can take this as far as you want. If you do a Google search, you'll find um, spinach cookies, spinach chocolate chip cookies, all kinds of kale dessert recipes. Why not? I mean, if you like to bake and you like to experiment, why not have fun you know, playing around with it and, and trying some veggie desserts, if that appeals to you? And it's a really nice idea to grow some veggies of your own. Here's Van Gogh Vegetable Gardens in Montmartre, Montmartre, which is the northern part of Paris looking down on the city. So that must be what it looked like back in the 1880s. And um, even if you don't have room or the time or inclination to have a big vegetable garden, there's something to be said for just having like a pot of tomatoes or berries or something growing if you have a porch or a deck or even herbs on a windowsill. There's something about just growing a little bit of our own food that's really nice. Um, the question comes up about raw versus cooked uh, when it comes to vegetables, and they're both really good. It's not like we should only eat raw or only eat cooked. I know there is a whole big raw food movement out there, but there's advantages to both. So if you're eating them raw, um, if weight control is a goal of yours, there's more satiety to them. They're crispy, they're, they seem more fibrous, they're bulkier, they take longer to eat, so we get fuller more from eating raw veggies. You know, imagine if you tried to eat three carrots, you'd be, you know, might feel pretty full. Um, and also that vitamin C that, that is sensitive to heat you'll be sure to get more vitamin C from the raw ones. However, with cooked vegetables, some nutrients are more available. Some of the carotenoids like lycopene are much more available in cooked tomato products than raw ones, for example. So it's a good idea to get both. With cooking veggies, um, here's some good cooking techniques. Um, Steaming, whether you steam, steam on the stovetop or in the microwave is good. There's less nutrients loss as compared to boiling when the veggies are totally submerged. Um, roasting is really nice. This is a pan of roasted purple cabbage and leeks and broccoli and garlic with olive oil. Um, 
So there's nice caramelization that goes on with roasting. They just taste so good and you can do a big pan and they keep in the fridge for a few days. So those are really enjoyable. And stir frying is a great quick method of cooking veggies. Um, when you stir fry, no matter what else you're cooking, you can emphasize the veggies and have a lot of them. So even, like if you're doing a chicken broccoli dish, you could have a lot of broccoli. I find that broccoli just tastes so good stir fried with some ginger. You know, stir fry it in some olive oil and put in ginger. It's really, really nice. You can serve your stir fried veggies over brown rice or another whole grain. And definitely do use oil. You'll get more of the vitamins. And you can, you can definitely stir fry in a wok, but you don't absolutely have to have a wok to stir fry. You can just use a big frying pan. So now I would like you to think about what your plan is. Do you need to eat more veggies? Are you not coming close to, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but what's recommended is a minimum of seven to 10 servings per day of fruits and vegetables. If you, if you feel like you're not coming close to that, maybe you need to get more veggies. Do you eat a lot, but is it all of one or two kinds and do you need more variety? Do you wanna try them at a different meal? So if anybody um, would like to share your answers with us, we'd love to hear. But even if not, just be thinking for yourself what you would like to do. Well, Ingrid yeah. has a question about grilling vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, what about grilling? So grilling food, grilling veggies is good, but like with other foods we grill, my understanding is it's safest not to grill them to the point where they're getting charred. So we shouldn't be eating burned matter. That, that is not healthful. But as long as we're not doing that, um, sure. Uh, Monica says she'd be interested in trying to eat veggies at breakfast. Uh, she does pretty well with lunch and dinner, but not reaching the seven to 10 servings. Okay. And also back, bear in mind that a serving, what's thought of as a serving can be pretty small. So a serving of cooked vegetables, we tend to say it's a half a cup. So if you're sitting down and eating a cup and a half of steamed broccoli, that's really three servings. So it might be easier to get those seven to 10 servings in than you think, and more is better. So I have a question. I've been um, pickling um, radishes and red onions, mm -hmm. just like quick pickling. Mm -hmm. um, is that, how is that nutrition wise? So are you, pick, it's good. Are you pickling, like, is it a salt, a brine, or is it a vinegar pickling? It's a vinegar pickling uh, with just a little bit of salt and a little bit of maple syrup. And I boil the, the vinegar and water mixture and then I pour it over the vegetables. Oh, that sounds so good. It, they actually are really good. My, my 15 month old loves the red onion, um, which yeah. is very surprising. It is very um, surprising. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I find myself eating more radishes because of it. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we have a comment from Elaine. I absolutely need to eat more veggies. I just created my shopping list. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Elaine. Uh, from Jean, the idea of eating oil with veggies is new to me. I usually steam them. If I have some bread with margarine, does that have the same effect? Yes, as long as there's fat in the same meal. So they don't have okay. to be cooked in oil. And I don't mean that anybody needs to be very rigid about this. If you like snacking on, for example, raw carrots and you're not accustomed to having fat with that, don't worry about it. But I think that some of the time, especially with a meal, you're usually having some fat in that meal anyway, and it will take care of itself. She also asks about guacamole, which makes everything good. What about it? Oh, sure. Yeah, guac is great. So avocados, which are technically a fruit, are super nutritious, and it can be a vehicle for other, other great produce, cilantro, tomatoes, onions. Sure. Any other shares or questions? I have one more comment to share. Let's see, okay. So a point I wanna make. 
some of you might remember this. Um, so this is was President George Herbert Walker Bush, our 41st president. And this incident occurred on March 22nd, 1990. I can't, again, I can't see all of you, but does anybody remember this, the broccoli incident? Okay, so here's what it is. He got on the news and said, I do not like broccoli. And I haven't liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it. And I'm president of the United States and I'm not going to eat any more broccoli. And then he went on to say that for the broccoli vote out there, Barbara loves broccoli. So I honestly remember when this happened and I remember feeling I was mildly outraged. How could the president of the United States be saying that he doesn't like broccoli? That's terrible advice to give people. So we all change, we all evolve, I've changed. And now I just think it's really cute and really funny. And it, it makes the point that don't, you don't have to eat anything you really don't like. Just about everyone can find some vegetables that they do like, or maybe some vegetables that they haven't tried that they'd be willing to try. And even sometimes our tastes change. So sometimes it's worth trying something we haven't tried in a long time, um, you know, just to see if that's occurred. But anyway, just wanted to share that with you. We do have a couple of questions. Um, sure. One from Philomena. Mm -hmm. uh, does roasting mean putting under the broiler? No, I mean, I, to me, it just means that would be broiling, it's similar, but to me, it just means putting it in a hot oven. So people can share how they do it. What I tend to do is set the oven for either 400 or sometimes 425. And I coat the veggies with extra virgin olive oil usually. I season them with whatever combination salt, pepper, herbs I'm gonna do. And I, I cook them till they seem to be the, the way that I like them, kind of fork tender. I may have them covered loosely for part of that time because what sometimes happens is some veggies might start to burn a little or just get too crisp while others aren't done. So I may loosely cover the pan for part of that time. I don't know if anyone else has any veggie roasting tips that you wanna share. Philomena says she thinks of putting it in the oven as, a, as baking, um, but she says she will do what you said. Okay, that's interesting. It could be, and I'm not sure, it could be that it's just the high temperature that makes it defined as roasting, but I will look into that and see what I find. Uh, Jean has a question about, um, are there any vegetables that rabbits won't eat? It's been a tough year in the garden this year. Unfortunately, I don't know of any. Um, we're growing a very small amount at my home and we've got it with covering it with like a wire mesh covering because of the rabbits. Does anybody else know of any that the rabbits won't eat? I'm sorry, I wish I could help you with that. We should all, you know, we'll have to do a Google search of that for ourselves, those that are, of us that, are, that have rabbits. Well, Philomena says, her Italian mother says eggshells help to scatter them around the really? garden, I guess. Okay. Thank and you. Jean says they don't eat tomatoes and green onions, but that's all she knows of. Okay. Well, that's a good start. And there are a lot of rabbits. <laughs> They're out there. Or a marigold border uh, coming from Ingrid. Oh, My yeah. I know the marigolds help to keep away some of the insects. Is that, that's what I understand. Any other thoughts or questions? Uh, Philomena says the marigolds keep deer away too. Wow, the marigolds are just wonderful. And they're pretty. Yeah, they're beautiful and they have a great aroma for those of us that like them. Are they edible? Do you know? I don't know. I've never heard that they are. I'm gonna look that one up too. That would be interesting. I know that. Mon Go ahead. Oh, nasturtiums are, and yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, Monica asks, do you massage your kale when you serve it in a salad? Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Monica. I, I, I recently started to do that because I read about it. So yes, I do massage, the, so the 
So the kale salad recipe uses all extra virgin olive oil and lemon juice. And yes, I do massage the, um, leaf, the dressing into the leaves. What it does is makes them more tender and more delicious to eat. You don't have to do it, but I find that it's worth the few minutes to do it to make it just taste better. Yeah. And I think it does say that on the recipe if you read it. I've actually eaten um, and made a kale salad where we massaged avocado into the kale oh, and put great. cherry tomatoes and some sort of seed. Uh, it was very, very good. That's a great idea. Well, because it's another oil, there's so much fat and avocado, good fat. So yeah, why not? Thanks for that tip. Does anybody have any other questions for Judy? We're just about a minute over our time, but that you know, we don't have a, a class coming up after. So if there's another question or two, we can handle that. Looks like we're all set. So I, yes. anyway, I just want to say I really appreciate so much everyone coming. It's great to see all of you and hear from you and hope to see you again in another class before too long. Yes, thank you so much, Judy. I've added the two links to the uh, chat again, just so you don't have to scroll all the way back up for them. Um, we're getting a bunch of thank yous from uh, Philomena and Monica and Elaine. Um, Patty says, excellent. Uh, great class from Melody. Yahweh says, thank you, very, very helpful. Thank you. So, yes, thank, thank you, you, Judy. Um, Judy yeah. will be back again in September. I forget the exact date, but it's the second Saturday. It's the 12th, and we're going to talk about fiber, and I'm going to yes. try to make fiber fun. <laughs> Perfect, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm sure we'll all learn something new about fiber as well. Thank you. Thanks yes, for all right. Everyone. Take care. Yes, thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye.